It occurred to me on the way down here that 16 years ago, today, I was three foot deep in, in flood water in my home. That particular flood turned my life upside down. That particular flood is the Mary, the end result is the Mary you see today. It changed my life. It just was so awful and there was no help, no support, no advice, no nothing, no National Flood Forum to help us. We didn't see a soul for a week. We got on with it ourselves and it was that that sort of drove me to actually think about helping other people. I didn't want people to go through what I went through. And I have to, I'm going to say a lot of what Paul said and a lot of what Graham said, but flooding is about people. And I do a fair bit of training in, in what I do now. And I always say to people that we've all got stuff going on in our lives. Each one of us has got something we are worried about right now. And actually, when you're flooded on top of that, it compounds the, the, the dreadful stuff that you're already going through. And the number of stories, and I'm sure Paul will endorse this, that I have heard. I had just had a newly diagnosed autistic son two weeks before. We were reeling from that. He's now 19 years old and six foot three and still can't talk or wipe his bottom. So that's what we were going through then. And then we were flooded. Next door to me, an agoraphobic lady who um, hadn't been out of her house, not even to have her baby. And she found a carpet of poo this thick, 21 foot long in her open plan sitting room and kitchen. She had a nervous breakdown. Next door to her, a newly bereaved woman who had just been looking at her wedding photographs the night the flood came in and upended the coffee table she'd left them on. And, 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 everybody's got stories. Somebody diagnosed with cancer one day, flooded the next. Somebody gets flooded, loses their mother. So it, then you have to become um, a project manager of, that was a, a building site that was your home. You have to try and, and live probably way out of your area in substandard accommodation. You're trying to get your kids back to school. You're holding down a job. You're making numerous telephone calls every day to the insurance industry. And that is why I'm passionate about what I do and why Paul is passionate about what he does to actually put pe people at the centre of what we do. So... As many of you will know, I come from Worcester that's infamous for being flooded. And this was some, the, the toilet was my house three years ago, uh, sorry, 16 years ago today. And um, that was one of the floods beforehand when my son, we were doing a house up and my son found um, his downstairs bedroom, uh, his temporary bedroom full of flood water. And um, we were flooded on many occasions. And we all know, this is a picture of the Foss Barrier, that, as Paul has said, that a flood alleviation scheme does not reduce, it, doesn't, it reduces your risk, it doesn't take it away. And even robust defences like the ones in Keswick, with this massive tree against it, the tree didn't smash the glass flood defence, but it was still overtopped. And we must always be aware of that, and it's something that I've been banging on for a long time now. One of the villages I live very nearby, we attended a wonderful celebration of their flood alleviation scheme in Kemsey, and it had been tested in anger and the, the residents were delighted. They had been flooded on many occasions. And one night, the pump was nice, ticking, ticking away nicely and pumping away, and all the residents went to bed feeling safe. The pump sent a misinformation back to the system that was managing it and turned the first pump off and not turned the second one on. The residents woke up to find all their homes three, four foot underwater. And of course, they were absolutely desperate. So we've always got to remember that. And we all know, we've, been, we've heard today, all day, that, uh, that um, floods have the capacity to take out a community, just like this one. And again, the aftermath of a flood in, in the 2005 Carlisle. And again, how would you like to leave a home with just a changing bag? And how would you like to be rescued like this, often in the middle of the night, 
flood environment agency flood warnings tend to come about 3.30 in the morning and it's really frightening and upsetting. And one of the things I have written is the, the Know Your Flood Risk Guide to Flood Recovery. And it, we, what I've got an amazing researcher called Carly Rose, who is the brains of my organisation. And she researched all the guides that are available and put them together, uh, best ones together, with my hints and tips from my own experience and shared experience from other people. Now, one thing I, I've th that we've just started today, the Environment Agency's Flood Awareness Fortnight. And it absolutely baffles me that the awareness is so, so low. And when people buy a house, we get loads of paperwork, don't we? And we don't bother to look through it all. And I, I really feel that solicitors have a moral obligation to actually flag up flood risk in that huge packet, uh, package of papers and tell people their flood risk so they can go into it with their eyes open and plan, prepare and mitigate or um, back out of it. It all depends on uh, people's individual choice, but two thirds of households fail to check their flood risk, even now. And here's a sort of a, sky, a sliding table, and believe it or not, the, the northeast, 88% of people don't check their flood risk. So we, I can, can I encourage you, the Environment Agency are doing sterling job, they've got something called Thunderclap where that in, with social media that we've all, a lot of us have signed up to, that sort of really join with them to, to sort of keep hammering home about flood awareness. And um, one of the things that I, I bought when I did move home, my ex-husband lives in my old home, incidentally, it is a flood resilient, so I've left him with a flood resilient home. Um, <laughs> Um, is that I bought a sort of desktop flood report, cost me 25 quid, and I went into my new property with my eyes open, knowing what to expect. Um, and you can buy one of those from the Know Your Flood Risk campaign or from Landmark Home Check or Argyle. Argyle. There are lots of them about. And obviously, we've talked about flood breeze, so I'll breeze over that because we're all aware of it. Um, now, this is uh, my um, prototype flood resilient and resistant house that I have drawn um, and I've done that really from, um, from obviously my own knowledge and also putting together the best of everybody that I've interviewed uh, across the last two years either on the DEFRA uh, funded project or on the Know Your Flood Risk funded project just finding out the interventions, the different interventions that people have taken I found a lovely graphic designer and he got into my head and drew that. He's now in therapy, but um, it, it's not, not brilliant in a PowerPoint, but it is on the knowyourfloodrisk.co.uk um, new guide if you want to have a look at it. Um, this guy, I was up with the BBC in um, Cockermouth and he called me in. He'd been flooded only 10 days before and you can see that his Christmas tree was back up. He was just reloading his kitchen. He was, he was dry. He was on top of the world and he was quite damn proud of himself and he wanted to tell us because he'd made his home flood resilient. He'd had five foot of water in his house and he was on his way back to normal and he was quite evangelical about what he'd done and how everybody should be doing it. Now, there's a, f a few um, case studies that I've recently done, and this property here uh, was flooded very badly in, um, in the Boxing Day floods uh, in Leeds, and he had already put in uh, property-level resilience measures, as you can see, but they were overtopped, just like hard-engineered defences can be overtopped. And this guy, he said to me, well, he, funny enough, he's the chair, the ex-chair of the Property Care Association. So he's in the industry himself. And he was, he, his house was flooded, as was his mother-in-law's house. And um, he said he lives within a, a pistachio chucking nuts distance of the river. So he was very aware of his flood risk. But he's now putting back uh, flood resilient repair he, that, that particular flooring there, top left, is something called aqua step, and he's very meticulous. He's, na he's numbered each bit so he can put it back down again, and he's using the cavity wall membrane system. And because he's got a very, very thick property, he's raised the, his property level resilience measures, and he's got pumps as well. Now, all these, the details of these can be f more details can be find, found in the Know Your Flood Risk guide. So I'm just breezing over them. And this one is, is Sue um, from, from 
Cockermouth. She, I managed to get her a free um, kite marked door here, which she knows will give her some time to move her stuff. She has been flooded on many occasions and this last flood was seven foot deep. Now, as a result of some measures she'd done in the previous time, she hasn't been flooded, uh, she hadn't, didn't have flood insurance this time, and she was, I'm very glad to say, the very first customer of Flood Re. Um, she, um, she had already had flood resilient plaster, so she didn't have to pull that off, and you can see she had hardwood um, w window sills and things. So she wanted to use her grant for, for better to actually improve her kitchen. So she's moved her boiler upstairs and she's got um, a freestanding kitchen and th the rest of the walls. And you can, can't really see it, but the walls are tiled right up to the ceiling. So she can literally just hose it down and she knows she will flood again. So she's decided that this is the way forward. And actually, you know, I have quite a bit of kitchen envy there. I don't think it looks too bleak. <coughs> and many of the houses I've been in, I've, I've left wishing I had their kitchen. This was um, a shop in Keswick that you may have been in, Graham, actually, uh, Kendall, sorry, that you may have been in. And they had a, a lot of water. And they just decided to, um, to pull off the plaster. And then they found this beautiful um, brickwork, that the same that was on the outside. And they've lime mortared it and built a stone staircase out of the same material. And he's got, um, this is... Um, a wood burning stove so and they've got concrete floors and that one believe it or not is is just ceramic tiles you wouldn't know it's ceramic tiles but it is and that the big um, wood burning stove is under the staircase sort of here it is and um, he, he just plans on lighting it and putting it on full and drying out his property like that so it's half a shop half a home now the lighting's not very good but the um, the kitchen unit here he found that by a river believe it or not, that granite kitchen um, sink unit, he found it by a river, it had been there for 18 months and so they decided that nobody wanted it, so they fixed, fitted it in and they've used similar um, brick for, for the, the, the supports and then put granite on the bottom. Everything they've used has been recycled and refound and reused and hasn't cost very much and they're really quite proud of themselves there. Um, this one I'm trying to see because the light's not brilliant, where's, where's this property? Oh yes, this is Oxford. Now, um, Paul was talking just now about people in 2007 bursting into tears still. The guy that did this spoke at the Property Care Association conference and um, he, he actually, he's six foot three, big guy. And he's halfway through his talk, he suddenly, he was reliving what had happened to his family. He broke down and he openly sobbed to the sun stunned silence of about 250 delegates. I was chairing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go and cuddle him, whether that would make it worse. And, and I, I offered for him to stop. But then when he sat down next to me, I then, covered, I, I then cuddled him. But having gone through that flood in Oxford with his family and his small children, he said he was never going to go through that again. And he's actually, this, these photographs are living proof that he's not. He's used this cavity wall membrane system with some, some pumps and he has got property level resi resilience measures at the door. But this is inside where his children were playing during that flood. Now, he's quite evangelical about telling people what he's done and how passionate he, he is about it because it has changed their lives. He's also an active member of the, of the Oxford Flood Alliance. So... Um, you know, again, he's empowering and working with the community and it's an absolutely excellent flood group in, in Oxford. Um, this one is one of the case studies, again, from probably your flood group in Buckinghamshire. It's from Roger. Um, and he, he has been, he's done lots of flood resilience and a lot of common sense because his wife is disabled, so it's just him that has to prepare the house for flooding. And you can see here, he actually gets his heavier furniture up on bricks, inside polythene bags, so the bricks don't cause any more muck. And he literally uses a plank of wood to go like that to lift them up. He has got sacrificial carpet tiles, his sump pumps, and that kitchen there has been flooded. Um, I've got pictures of it with, with flood water halfway up it, and he's pulled it out, dried it, sanitised it, and reused it. So he is really quite passionate about the fact that he knows this works. 
Um, and it's not a picnic, you know, but it's a heck of a lot better than being out of your home for nine months to plus. And this one, uh, the guy here flooded just like me with more sewage. He's got some non-return valves and he's also built walls like this that he can fit uh, property level resilience in. And, um, you know, he, again, he, he has um, survived a couple of floods like this. And this one for the DEFRA case studies, I, I love this couple actually. They've got a marble type stone floor throughout, but it had lovely um, rugs on it. It looked lovely, it looked ho homely. They've taken the, the stone skirting boards uh, instead of skirting boards and they use those to put their, um, those stands to put their settees, uh, their settees and heavy furniture on. Those buckets, everything outside got put in the buckets, sturdy buckets with lids on and just floated about till the flood water went. And that's a double decker um, hen house as well. Now, I don't know whether I put on this, but no, I haven't. They've got, they've got their, all their electrics up here for, they've got a series of pumps and all their electrics are up here for the pumps. This one is another one of the DEFRA uh, case studies, um, groundwater flooding. And this cottage has flooded since the 1780s with groundwater and this was well, the original floor and you can see that it, it's it's suffered flooding and that dresser was built when the house was built it has been flooded on umpteen occasions it's solid pine and they, they just literally wash it down and carry on with it after the sort of recent floods and she was flooded on her birthday Flood, floods come anytime you know they're not discerning christmas and birthdays they pick on us and, and they, she's put down a solid floor here and lime plaster and just plans on sweeping out. And also she has got her electrics isolated. So she's got upstairs electrics so she can live upstairs and turn off the downstairs while the flood water's there. And this one, death of case study, the guy had actually got so sick of being flooded in, in Todmorden he, that he moved his kitchen upstairs and he put his boiler uh, right up the wall. He's got a puddle sucker, John, you'll be pleased to see. Um, and he loves his puddle sucker and uh, you know he's just really just become more resilient to flooding and just deals with it and this one is I'm going to be finishing with this one because this is my favorite actually this was on just up from the Foss barrier a delightful couple in their 70s lived there and when I arrived I thought oh heavens why have I come here they've not done anything that was the best bit I couldn't tell that they had done anything. And their floor on the way in, I don't know whether I can see it, if it's that one. That, that, I thought that was a wooden floor. It's actually ceramic tiles that looks like wooden floor. Their living room looks like parquet flooring. It's not. They've been tanked up to dado lev level. Um, and they've got, the, you can see their kitchen, uh, their cookers up there, but they can take all this down very, very quickly, leaving the granite work surface. And you can see that they're, um, kitchen basket baskets can all be removed. This is them. They were so lovely, um, and they keep all that that their stuff higher up. And they uh, and as they're older, it's helpful that they haven't got to bend down for their washing machine and their tumble dryer. And they've also used their grant money to actually have what they called a flood cupboard, and it was up some steps. And all the equipment they need for putting their settees on and their flood gates and their pumps and everything all in place they've also got two pumps now the best bit about this they have been flooded 10 times now in those 10 times um, there were sort of the, the, the pump kept the water out to about four inches they literally just when the flood water had gone he went round with the hose pipe she sanitized they got the dehumidifiers out and they say they were back to normal within one hour of the flood going now, what, what's not to like, really, because they chose to live there. Incidentally, the, the estate agent had said, uh, had highlighted in red that the house was at risk of flooding. So that's in, a, in line with the ABI's traffic line system. They knew it. They bought with their heart, head, their heart rather than their head. They loved the view. They loved the cottage. They still love it. And they, they are really, I'm hopeful they're going to be talking on Radio York tomorrow about their experiences. So... Um, you know, I'm going to finish with them, I think, but because they, to me, are the ultimate flood resilient couple. And just so you know, this guide, Mary is exhausted. I tell you, we talk about the Bonfield report and how many people actually did that. We, uh, my colleague Carly, who is amazing, and I, 
researched and got everything together for this guide. It went live yesterday, the Know Your Flood Risk um, .co.uk website. It covers a little bit with all risk management authorities, what they do, and what, including Scotland, Ireland and Wales. And when I told somebody from the agency that I'd done it, she said, how long did it take you to do? A year? No, it didn't. It took me a, a lot of nagging, but a um, couple of months, but I did it. And so it covers all the different kind of gizmos out, out there. It's got all the case studies in. Um, uh, you know, it's well worth a read if you've got, um, if you suffer from insomnia, but also if you, um, if you've got no people at risk, that may, it may help them. And you can get um, more information from my own website, from the National Flood Forum Blue Pages, and also from the Property Care Associ Association Flood Protection Group, which incidentally it has its first. Um, sort of installers, what, what you should be thinking about when you're fitting property level protection course um, this month. So and I'm looking forward to attending that. And thank you very much. And that view may be very lovely, but not when those swans are looking in your sitting room window. Thank you. <laughs>